Uncovering reasonable doubt with the component method. What is the component method? What you're going to learn today is you're going to learn a philosophy and a methodology. When a client says to you, my life is in your hands, it's real. You can't have a bad day in one of these investigations. You drop the ball, somebody can be executed. You know, most attorneys have no clue how to conduct an investigation. When you go to law school, you know how many classes you get on investigation? Zero. Hi, my name is Brandon Perrin, and I'm the National Director of the Criminal Defense Investigation Training Council. I'd like to introduce you in the next few minutes to some of the different programs that we offer. I'd like to also show you how we can benefit you and how our specific academic training programs can benefit your clients. We're going to offer you training in a variety of areas, including fundamentals of criminal defense investigation, which include explanation and training in the component method of investigation, which I developed in 1994 as a way to provide the criminal defense investigator with a specific course of action for conducting a comprehensive criminal defense investigation. A comprehensive investigation which allows you to uncover all the facts that may be related to the questions of guilt or innocence. We're also going to introduce you to some programs including homicide investigations, advanced interviewing, and forensic testimonial evidence recovery. We have courses in ethics and sexual battery investigations. You will find that our programs are the most comprehensive available today, that the Criminal Defense Investigation Training Council is the leader in the profession, not only in respect to academic training, but as well as certification. Uncovering reasonable doubt, the component method, this field guide will guide you through every investigation possible, any investigation you could possibly encounter in criminal defense investigation, from a simple battery to a first degree homicide. What we're teaching you is a philosophy and a methodology, something that you can use, something that you can refer to, not follow as a checklist, but use as a guide. What you're going to rely on is your critical and creative thinking skills. That's what's going to get you through this process. That's what's going to make it happen. You're about to be introduced to the component method of investigation. The component method of investigation was developed to provide the criminal defense investigator with a course of action, a plan for conducting comprehensive investigations. Each step of the component method is designed to provide you with a way to develop leads, identify inconsistencies, discrepancies, and move on to the next component. I want you to pay attention to what you're about to see because this is going to provide you with the keys to success, the keys to freeing those people who have been falsely accused and who are oppressed. And I'm sure that you will benefit from it. In the end, you will already find yourself being more informed, more knowledgeable, and your skill level would have been increased significantly. Thank you. What we're going to take today, though, is an interesting turn and a little twist and focus primarily on the discipline of a criminal defense investigation. It does have its own thing. Um, as far as criminal investigation is concerned, if you have any law enforcement experience, you're going to see a lot of similarities, but you're going to see a totally different perspective, more of a civil rights, human rights perspective going on here. We're going to be focused more on other aspects and components of the Constitution, like the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, you know, American jurisprudence as it was defined to be to, uh, to defend against an intrusive government, so to speak. You know, William Blackstone's quote, better that 10 guilty escape than, ten in than one innocent suffer, is really what is focused upon here. We're not going to be focusing on so much the tangible evidence, so to speak, as we are going to be looking at abstracts. One of the things you're going to see as a criminal defense investigator is that the tool that is at our, at our disposal the most, the, the number one weapon in our arsenal, is the intellect. That's what you're going to be focused on because we're dealing with abstract ideas. We're dealing with law, man-made concepts. You know, we're not looking for physical evidence in the form of trace evidence or blood evidence. We're not looking for the murder weapon, so to speak. It'd be nice if we found it. Don't get me wrong. It'd be nice to come across those things, but it's rare that you do. What you're going to be dealing with and speaking about and learning about today, and we're going to hear me mention a lot, are factual nuances. Okay, factual nuances are those little pieces of facts, little pieces of information that are intertwined with all all the facts of the experience of the event of the incident that you can kind of identify and pick out and start to build a sound defense theory whether it be a self-defense mistaken identity whatever it could be uh, an alibi you have to look for these things we kind of start off in almost a shotgun approach to the investigative process you don't focus in what we learned in law enforcement was that uh, one of the first concepts we'll talk about today was what's the first thing you do in a criminal investigation? It determine, determine a crime has been committed. That's the first thing that you do in a law enforcement investigation. The 
The second thing that we would do in law enforcement is conduct an investigation to, you know, to uh, uncover evidence leading to a suspect. Then you identify a suspect. Okay, it becomes narrower much narrower. We're going to do that too. We're going to narrow it, but we really kind of take more of a jigsaw puzzle approach. You know, there's a big puzzle to put together and we have to get all the pieces. At any particular day or time, not all the pieces fit. And we have to not dispose of them or dismiss them as not being part of the picture we want to put in place. We don't have a picture we want to put in place. The only picture we want to put in place is the truth. That's it. That's our role. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, this program is accredited by the Criminal Defense Investigation Training Council. That's the organization that accredits and certifies uh, criminal defense investigators across the country. I think in about 18 states or something like that right now. I forget the count increases daily. Um, so it is nationally recognized and accepted by uh, the federal government and state government for training and certifying criminal defense investigators and public defender agencies as well as private investigators so across the country who specialize in criminal defense. Okay, uh, The program here is the basic eight-hour course that can be used towards board certification. If you attend this class and you have the eight hour certification certificate of training, you can use this to become a board certified criminal defense investigator which is used in combination with uh, experience as well as recommendation from two defense attorneys and there's a couple of hoops you have to jump through basically are signing an oath of office, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? I hear much of people calling out to punish the guilty but very few are concerned to clear the innocent. Daniel Defoe, this is a great quote. It's really again pushing on the philosophy of what we do. You're going to hear me talk about philosophy a lot today. And primarily because it's my opinion that the investigator is ultimately a, a thinker. That's what we are. We're problem solvers. Um, that's what people hire us for. Whether you're doing civil cases, domestic cases, you're doing criminal cases, no matter what it is, you're a problem solver. People come to us because somebody else really screwed up bad. <laughs> Something's going wrong. Or, and in the private sector, people come to us because they're desperate. They have, even the attorneys can't help them at this point. They send them to us because they say you need an investigator before we, even we can help you because your case is such a mess, the facts are so spread out, there's such a problem, we've got to confine it, we've got to reduce it to something that I can use, that I can work with, information that I can manage. Right now, when you know most lawyers speak to a client, they're just rambling on and on and on and on about all their problems, how the world is coming down to them. What do we do as investigators? We go out and we, we contain it. We bring it back to them to work with. The same holds true for criminal defense investigators even more so. When we say people are desperate in criminal defense matter, they are extremely desperate. So much so that their liberty depends on it or their life. No investigative process, no uh, discipline, and no area of the investigation field is, is more, uh, it requires more responsibility. When a client says to you, my life is in your hands, it's real. You can't have a bad day in one of these investigations. You drop the ball, somebody can be executed. You know, you missed a point, you missed something, you weren't paying attention, you decided that the fundamentals of the investigative process weren't important, you skipped a, a, a corner, you know, you skipped some things, whatever it is, you don't follow the guidelines. You don't, and guidelines being what you know to be effective investigation. There is no checklist mentality for criminal defense investigation. It doesn't work because you never know what you're going to encounter in the field. You just don't know. You, every case is different. Human beings are all pretty much the same. There's only so many ways to kill somebody. The problem is all the parts are interchangeable. So in any given case, it's a conglomeration of all the parts of a different case, you know. So experience does matter. But even more than experience, what we require is knowing the fundamentals, the philosophy and the methodology for conducting a criminal defense investigation. Understanding that so you can make sure you leave no stone unturned is going to be important. And this is one of the, 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 the things that we do. Very few. You're the very few. Even taking the step in wanting to learn this process and pursue this process means you're one of the few who care, who care enough to be a professional. We have a philosophy to what we do a thought process behind what we do, and we have a methodology for getting it done. And that's what the component method is. It was devised for that. What is it? It's an impartial and objective method of uncovering and evaluating all available evidence and facts related to the question of guilt or innocence. Let's break this down again, and as our little guy's doing, it's magnified. Impartial and objective. Very important to stress this point. Impartial and objective, okay? which means we don't spin. We don't spin. We can't. We've got to maintain a position of professionalism that we're impartial and objective advocates of the truth. That's what we are. The lawyer has to rely on you to tell him like it really is, just as that trainer did to tell the fighter. This is the way it really is because if I don't tell you the truth, if I spin it, make it sound better, tell you what you want to hear, to get that attaboy a pat in the head and put a smile on the lawyer's face, the problem is going to happen is when they go into that courtroom, they're going to get a spanking. Something's going to come out. Some piece of information is going to come out that is going to ambush them in the courtroom. They won't be prepared for it, just like that right hook. If you're not prepared for it, what happens to you? 
boom, you're on the canvas. You're done. That's what we're here to protect them for, impartial and objective. And not to mention, being an advocate of the truth puts you in a position where you can never be attacked. Think about it. If someone says you're an advocate, anybody here is an advocate of anything. If you're an advocate for or against the death penalty, I can take a side against you, right? Anyone who is as, as intelligent as you, who believes in their position as much, could debate you and win on any given day, depending on the points that are taken, right? Whether it be uh, the death penalty, it be abortion, it be politics, it be religion. Any position you take can be debated. There's one position that you can take and be an advocate of that you cannot come under attack. I am an advocate of the truth. The reason is, what is the opposite? Say, I'm an advocate of the truth. And if they, they say, you take another position, I'll debate you. What would they say? I'm an advocate of fabrication. I'm an advocate of lies. I'm an advocate of deceit. I'm an advocate of the truth. How do you get attacked with that? You stood on a witness stand, and they said, you're an advocate of any position, man. He says, yes, I am. What? The truth. They're going to be stuck there with their tongue hanging out of their mouth, not knowing what, how to attack you on it. There is nowhere to go with you on that. I'm an advocate of truth. which seems professional. My job is to uncover the truth and report it to you know, the client that I'm working for, reported to the attorney I'm working for. That's what we're here for. Of uncovering and evaluating, okay, uncovering. Remember, you hear a lot of lawyers talk about creating reasonable doubt in the mind of a juror. We don't create anything. It's important to remember that. We don't create. To create would mean we have to create something from nothing, okay? There was nothing that we created something. We don't create anything. We uncover. We uncover and we locate what's already there, the truth. It's out there. You know, I hate to sound like an X-Files episode, but it's out there. The truth is out there, and we have to go find it. It may be under rocks. It may be buried in someone's mind. And, and you have to always understand in the investigative process that we're dealing with humanity. We're dealing with human beings, which means their role by nature is to deceive. Okay? They have the truth. Somebody has the truth, and they don't really want it known because for some reason it may spin back on them for whatever reason. And that's why investigators have had an interesting role throughout history. That no one, you know, it's kind of like the, 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 you ever meet a very truthful person, someone who's brutally honest, right? Are they ever really welcomed anywhere? Uh, anybody like them around? <laughs> like they call them outspoken, opinionated, a pain in the neck. The reason is they tell the truth, they call it like they see them. No one wants to hear the truth. No one wants to hear that. Okay, we don't really like the truth sometimes, so that's our role. That's why being an investigator is a very solitary job. So if you like to work alone, you like to work out in the field alone, you don't like to be bothered and supervised eight hours a day or 20 hours a day, whatever it may be, being an investigator is a great job. But it does require a lot of self-discipline and a lot of initiative. Otherwise, nothing gets done. You know, nothing really gets done. Uh, evaluating. Uh, important too. Not only do we uncover evidence, we evaluate it. We evaluate it for its, its, its value and to see where it can be placed, how it can be used. We evaluate it for veracity, for truthfulness, or to see if it's possibly been uh, contaminated, you know, someone's uh, attempting to deceive us, or it's just not credible. And another key word, all available evidence. All available evidence is very important because, you know, one of the things we have to recognize is that there's a great line from a Clint Eastwood uh, movie, and it says, a man's got to know his limitations. I don't remember the movie, but he said, a man's got to know his limitations. And we as investigators have to know our limitations. And our limitation is we can only uncover evidence that's available to us. That's it. You know, if people want to hold it back or, you know, for instance, you could be canvassing a neighborhood. You could go back five times, but no matter how many times you go back, you're just missing that one witness, that one person who just doesn't seem to be home. Every time you go, you leave a card, you just can't get a hold of them. You didn't even know they existed because they're a roommate or a visiting relative of a person who used to live there. And that's the one witness who saw it all, saw the whole thing. But that witness was not available to you. So we, can't, we have to know that there are limitations, which means when someone were to ask you, do you know exactly what happened in this case? Your answer professionally and rightfully should be, no, I don't know exactly what happened. I've got a good idea of what happened based on the evidence I've uncovered and I've been able to put together. However, I don't know everything. There's only one entity that had a complete view of this incident and knows the entire truth and all the truth, right? And that would be God. That's it. It's not me. Okay? That's it. That's what that would be. I don't know what it was. I can only tell you by uncovering the evidence and information that was available to me, I was able to put the pieces together of this virtual puzzle, and I can tell you this is what I see right now. And then we also have to accept the concept that you may look at a picture of something and someone else sees something totally different. You know, we see that every day in life, don't we? You look at something, well, that's this. No, it's not. It's that. You know, we, 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 our perspectives are different. Okay, and it's facts related to the question of guilt or innocence. Very important, guilt or innocence. Our job as criminal defense investigators is to conduct an investigation and uncover evidence that's going to support guilt or innocence. Investigative case review and analysis.
defendant interview, crime scene inspection, background investigations, witness interviews, and report of investigation and testifying. Those are the six components in a specific order. They are placed in that specific order for strategic purposes, okay? Strategy is everything investigation as well. Again, this is an adversarial process, which means you have to think tactically and strategically everything you do. The six components are placed in this manner for optimal results. Does it mean they always have to be done in this way? Always have to be done in this order? Absolutely not. They are not carved in stone, okay? It's there for under, it's under optimal situation. Let's say, anybody here been in the military? Okay. In the military, they trained soldiers. But in the military, they trained us to under training conditions, under the best conditions. They tried to throw us variables, but we learned how to engage in combat under optimal situations. When you actually go in the field, it's nothing like that. Okay, it's 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 a matter of falling back on your training, falling back on what you know, and picking piece, bits and pieces of it to get through that. That's what investigation is, and that's what this is for. Now, sometimes you will be able to follow every one of these steps in the way it's meant to be, but sometimes you will find yourself picking and choosing. For instance, I've got a case right now where we just picked up a uh, sexual battery case, a big sexual battery case. We wanted to get into the investigative case review analysis first. That's the way it should always be done. The problem, for three weeks we have not been able to get discovery material, which is all the, all the police reports and all the information and statements that can be reviewed and examined to help us move into the next stage. So what do we do? Wait forever? No. Go to component two. We interview the defendant. Then when we get it, we'll go back and do one. Then we'll bump back to three. But what if we do two and we don't have this yet? Well, we'll move on to three. You know, you move and go with the flow sometimes. You gotta get the case done, you gotta get it closed. The next method of investigation is investigative case review analysis, component one. Component one is the first step in the process for conducting a comprehensive investigation. I'd like you to pay attention to this right now because what you're about to be introduced to is takes and requires painstaking attention to detail. The investigative process requires more than just going out in the field and interviewing witnesses or doing record searches. What you're going to have to do is conduct a forensic analysis of all the discovery material that is available to you. Police reports, narrative reports, witness statements, transcripts, listening to audio tapes, watching videotapes, as well as going to the evidence locker and actually reviewing the physical evidence that has been covered by the police department. You are going to have to take a position of evaluating the state's case to not only identify discrepancies and inconsistencies, but also to develop leads that can be answered in the subsequent components. When we talk about how the component method works, let's discuss that for a moment. Investigative case review and analysis, what is that? Everybody know what discovery material is? Discovery is basically discovery are all the police reports, all the uh, statements, uh, everything, all the t uh, documentary evidence that reflects testimonial evidence and physical evidence that's going to be used against the defendant in trial. And what happens is when a person is charged, the defense attorney will file a motion for discovery, okay? And by law, the prosecutor has to provide them with copies of the information. They'll file an answer to the demand for discovery, and then they'll, you know, the, the defense attorney will send someone over to pick it up and come back with all those reports, whether it be this big, become this big, or it can be spread out in boxes across the floors, depending on the magnitude of that case. But that's what discovery material is. What we do is we conduct an investigative case review and analysis, and I don't mean just read the information. We're going to separate the information there that is evidence, such as police reports, narrative reports, supplemental reports, uh, uh, statements, transcripts, anything that is going to be used that is basically the foundation of the prosecution's case against the defendant. We're going to use that and analyze it. We're going to teach you the concept that that is evidence. It's not just nice to have, nice to, 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 to know information that the prosecutor has. Their entire case is built on that information by the initial responding officers, by the detectives, by the crime scene technicians, everybody. Are there any errors? Are there any flaws in that investigation? We need to know about it. We're also going to identify leads in that information that were not pursued. You're going to see that all the time. You know, where you'll start to read information and go, now why didn't they ask this witness this question? Or why didn't they go contact this person? Or why didn't they look into this or look into that or go here or go this? We're going to go into that information and we're going to not only identify flaws, inconsistencies and discrepancies in the prosecutor's case, but we're also going to identify leads. Leads leading to information and possible evidence that can lead to the truth. That's what we're going to do. What our investigators ultimately 
We're all about leads. That's what we're all about. And what are leads? They're just questions. They're questions that are left unanswered that may give us a better idea of the whole picture of what's going on here. So that's what we're going to do here. So investigative case review and analysis. We are now ready to move on to component two of the investigative process, the defendant interview. This process is crucial, recognizing some of the more delicate issues associated with the attorney-client privilege. One of the things we're going to talk about is not only what methods you use to recover the information from the defendant, but also recognizing how you approach the defendant. This is important. What we have to understand is that the attorney-client privilege is here. You're going to learn about the Covell privilege. The Covell privilege is the law that allows the investigator to be an agent of defense counsel, and it extends the attorney-client privilege to us, to you. So when you conduct that interview, you are recognized as agent of defense counsel. You need to pay close attention to this next component in the training you're about to receive because if you fail to follow some of the specific rules associated with this process, you could endanger your defendant's case and you could place his freedom in jeopardy. Then we have the defendant interview. Of course, we're going to go to, the, to jail. If he's incarcerated or she's incarcerated, we're going to interview the defendant. We're not going to do one of these nice little hand-holding sessions that lawyers tend to do. Okay? We're going to conduct an investigative interview. We're going to find out what happened detailed statement from that defendant. When I say statement, it's not going to be a handwritten statement, a record statement. It's going to be them telling you their story about what happened and, tell, and you, them answering your questions about their involvement in this matter or lack of involvement, as well as giving you information regarding anyone who can help support their version of events or that can lead you in a direction that may help you develop information that can assist them in their defense. That's what we're going to do with component two, the defendant interview. Again, this is done under the attorney-client privilege. So anything they say to you stays with you, and the lawyer, it, you cannot be subpoenaed, asked to tell what was said there. It stays with you, okay? Component three, this is one of my favorite components because we actually deal with some tangible issues. What we're talking about here is going to the crime scene. I mean, this is what everybody waits for. This is what we've been watching about since you were a little child, watching police shows, watching detective shows. You want, you've been wanting to get out there to the crime scene and see what really happens. One of the things I want to caution you on is we're not going to the crime scene to recover trace evidence, bloodstained evidence, or we're not going to find many dead bodies at the scene. What we're going there for is to recognize, identify, reconstruct this scene and compare it to testimonial evidence. Remember, we've spoken continuously about the importance of testimonial evidence as it relates to the criminal defense investigator. All these witness statements, all this documentary evidence, it all involves testimonial evidence that's going to be used against the defendant in trial. We have to use the crime scene to see if the testimonial evidence corresponds with the scene. Is there something missing? Is there something there that would obstruct the witness's view? Is there something that would question the credibility of that witness's statement? We're going to learn about taking diagrams, accomplishing photographs, taking measurements, canvassing neighborhoods. We're going to learn a lot about what goes on in a crime scene. And again, pay close attention here because this is one of the most important and significant components of the process. Failure to do a correct job here could cause your entire investigation to be a failure. Then we're going to do the crime scene inspection. That's next. We're going to actually go to the crime scene. In every case where there is a crime scene, you should go to the crime scene and examine that. Now, we're not going to go to the crime scene and conduct an examination like law enforcement did. We're not going there with all these special technological tools, looking for trace evidence, looking for fingerprints. We're going to the crime scene to compare that, the major discernible items of interest, the critical features of that scene, the layout and design, where the walls and the buildings are, and where the witnesses were in respect to their claim testimony. If witness A states they were standing on a specific corner observing the suspect doing something, we want to be able to go to that scene and make sure that it was actually possible for them to do that. Or was there a six-foot brick wall obstructing their view? Was there a lot of landscaping? They characterized their, their relationship uh, and focal point from the suspect as 25 feet. But when you go to the scene, you measure that out as 150 feet. Would that start to question the credibility of this witness and their ability to make a positive ID and such? You know, whether you went there during hours of darkness and they said there was plenty of lighting and you find there was no lighting in the area. And the lighting that was there cast shadows on the area where the suspect would have been running through. You get my idea? That's what we go to the crime scene for. We're going there to, to reconstruct the scene and compare that scene to witness testimony that is being used against the defendant. That witness testimony reflected in the, the discovery information noted in component one, as well as the, the statement provided by the defendant. Okay, you know, the defendant is a, is a primary witness. Now, do we believe everything the defendant says? Of course not. Again, Everybody's statement to us, no matter who they are, 
is subject to verification. That's the way we think, period. That's it. Uh, that's nice, you know, we've got to learn as investigators to shut down. You know, when you meet those people who are very personable, those people who could sell you a $3 bill, you know, you've got to learn to shut them down. You know, great, you have a great personality, but you still could be full of crap. <laughs> you know, and why, and start that, why are you being so nice to me? <laughs> you know, things like this. You just, it's, it's a difficult thing to do sometimes because we're human beings and we, we fall for certain things. We like certain people. You know, it's amazing what a smile can do to somebody, you know, to bring down the tone. But we've got to be careful to remember. And it's probably easier with that than it is with people you encounter that are just nasty and mean and arrogant. You ever meet a person you just hate? You just hate them. You can't stand them. For whatever biases, prejudices they may have, they may have those, this, this venom spewing out of their mouth. The problem we have as investigators is just because we don't like them, we don't like their philosophy, we don't like their political thinking, we don't like where they stand, we could think they're the most disgusting human being in the world. We have to remember that does not mean that they're lying, does it? It doesn't mean they're lying. It just means that we don't like them. And there may be no reason to like them, but we have to accept the fact that they could be telling the truth and the person we can relate to that we like could be lying. And that's a trap for us that we have to be very conscious of because we can fall into it very quickly. Okay, so and that's again what separates. You've got to kind of put your suit of armor on, so to speak, when you walk into an investigation to be able to be immune to some of these things. So crime scene inspection. Component four, background investigations. Now this is something we're gonna learn about today, but it's important for me to point out to you that when we do background investigations as a criminal defense investigator, we're not talking about going to the courthouse and just recovering records. What we're talking about is answering a simple question. What is the witness's reputation for honesty in the community? That's what we're after. Sometimes we could be focused on what the reputation of violence is in the community as well, depending on the allegations and the charges. However, what I want you to focus upon is thinking about what that witnesses reputation is. Consider reputation. What is that? A reputation is not only what they've done, it's what people think of them. Why do they think this of them? Because they have a specific pattern of behavior and they have exhibited this behavior in front of people. We tend as a society and as professionals to only focus on recovering records, public records, criminal records, etc. What I want you to consider here is that we also need to go after their reputation in the community. If someone is known to be a liar, if someone is known to be dishonest, you need to find those people and you need to find out why. What specific experience have they had with that individual? which would lead them to believe and come to the conclusion that they are not an honest person. Community. What is community? A community can be anything from a classroom to a social organization to a local bar as well as an entire town, a nation, or six billion people in this world. Community can be determined by each specific individual person you're investigating and you need to find out what communities they belong to. So pay attention to this next lecture and you will find that your ability to conduct comprehensive, effective background investigations will increase significantly. Then background investigations. We're doing background investigations focusing not only on a background investigation of the prosecution's witnesses, who they intend to use against the defendant, but also the witness we identify during the course of our investigation that will be used for the defense. What do they know? We do not want to put a witness on the stand or recommend a witness to defense counsel that is not credible. We do not want to recommend a witness that is impeachable. Okay? What are we going to be looking for in background investigations? We tend to think of background investigations and think of going to the courthouse, doing a criminal history such like this, find out if they've ever been arrested or convicted of a felony. That is all well and good, but that is just a small part of what we're gonna focus on for background investigations. In a criminal case where this person is going to be a witness against the defense, or even a witness uh, you know, for the defense, what the big question we're going to pursue is does this person enjoy a reputation for honesty in the community? That's what we're gonna be focused on. That's the big question you have to answer. Now think of the ramifications of that question. Does this person enjoy a reputation for honesty in the community? Enjoy a reputation. What is a reputation? Reputation is, you know, what people know about something about them. Yeah, on their track record, right? What they've done before. Not what they say they're going to do, but what they've actually done. And we say reputation. Reputations, are they only documented in files and records? No, right? Most reputations are word of mouth. What people know about you, okay? That's where real reputation, this is something investigators have been missing for a long time. We've gotten on this technology ride where I just go to the internet, 
You know, go to the courthouse, pull a record. No, that's not thinking. We could train monkeys to do that. You know, that's easy. We're investigators. We have to think. Reputation for honesty in the community. Okay, I know what a reputation is. I know, uh, okay, community. That's the big key. Where in what is a community? This is a community today, isn't it? This room right here. We're a community today. That's what we are. Community is the overall office, where you work, where you play, what clubs you belong to, your neighborhood. These are all communities. And the, in, the, the best information you're going to find regarding someone's reputation for honesty or dishonesty is going to be where they work, where they play, where they hang out, or where they used to work, used to play, used to hang out. Okay? Those people have had contact with them. They've had relationships with them, good or bad. And when someone says they do not enjoy, and it's an easy question to answer, and it catches people like you wouldn't believe, because they're not expecting it. And say, well, let me ask you something. Would you say that, the, that John Doe enjoys a reputation for honesty in the community? You'll be shocked how they go, hmm. <laughs> you know, they actually have, to, and it's like when they go, hmm. Now you know, there's something, because they should go, oh, yeah, right, a real honest guy, real honest guy, no problem at all. You know, then, you know, oh, well, that's, that's a witness who's supporting their, their honesty. But someone who goes, hmm, they're thinking. <laughs> yep, right away, they're like, no, not really. Well, the key there we're going to learn about today is you have to ask, okay, if you say no, give me a specific incident where that made you believe they're not honest. Something they did or have done that you personally know about. And then you get that incident. Now you have to find people to back up that incident. All that information can be admissible. All that information is something you can use to show they do not enjoy a reputation for honesty. Why? Because they're cheat. Why? Wow, you ever treated, cheated, sir? Yes, I was. Tell me about that. And who else was cheated? This person was. Bring that person in, right? Now you've got a jury looking at They're not honest. They're not honest. Just because you don't have a criminal record. I think we all agree on this. We meet a lot of people every day who have never been arrested, never had any police contact. But would you trust them with your wallet in the room alone? <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Just because they have not been subjected to any legal action does not mean they're not that they're, they're not a dishonest person or they are an honest person, right? So the best information that we can uncover in background investigation is not going to be found in your local courthouse. It's going to be found out there in the field, knocking on doors and talking to people, doing what investigators do best. That's why we had that old name from the 20s called the gumshoe, <laughs> you know, like Sam Spade, because it's what's on the bottom of our souls, pound, hitting the pavement and knocking on doors, because that's where real investigation is. It will never be replaced by the Internet. Never, because computers can't think, period. And those of us in the field know now, I think we both, both of you can know, most of the information out there is not on the internet, you know, or in any one central depository. There's no super computer sitting in Washington, D.C., okay, that you see in movies where they bring it up and there's always some picture of a guy in a tuxedo with a cocktail in his hand and has all his background. <laughs> you know, it just really isn't there. They have those computers, but they're only on known people who've been involved, you know. Everybody else is out there doing their thing, and that's where the real problem is. We're now going on to component five of the investigative process. Again, the component method has directed you through component one, investigative case review analysis, component two, the defendant interview, component three, crime scene inspection and examination, and component four, background investigations. Now we're moving on to one of the most significant and difficult components of the process, witness interviews. I want you to pay close attention to this next process. The witness interview is everything when it comes to criminal defense investigation. This is when you as the investigator are afforded the opportunity to actually talk to this witness and recover the information they have. Remember, it is your responsibility to recover that information. It is not the responsibility of the witness to give it to you. In addition, we have talked throughout this process about witness contamination, about evidence contamination. I want you to consider when you're doing this process that it's important for you not to contaminate the evidence, not to put words in the witness's mouth not to make them say what you want them to say or the defendant desires them to say. They have to tell you what they actually observed. You have to tell you what they only know to be true because of first-hand experience. There are several issues associated with witness interviewing that you have to be concerned with. One of them is documentation. Rules of discovery as well as attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine become very important here. How you document that interview could make a significant difference in how that case goes. Everything is strategy. Remember, we are critical and creative thinkers, and when you enter into that interview process, you are doing nothing less than engaging in intellectual combat. So get ready for some serious training. 
is about to happen right now. Witness interviews now. We move, now before we do the background checks, we, it would be nice uh, for optimal results. To, before we interview people, it would be nice to know about them, right? Know what their little quirks are, know what their backgrounds are. That will help us set traps in the interviewing process. It will also help us know when they're deceiving us, they're lying to us, they're not coming, becoming forthcoming with us. We know relationships exist, or experiences exist, they're not, that exist that they're not sharing with us, okay? So witness interviews are then. You've gone through the five components of six components in the component method. You're ready to enter a report of investigation and testify. It's time to wrap up the investigative process. This is where it's time for you to show those clients what you're made of. Time for you to show them what you can do. If you cannot accomplish an effective report, you may very well have failed. Remember, what you write down in that report, the way you communicate your results, means everything to the person who reads it. Most investigators are much better at conducting the investigation than they are reporting their own results. It's crucial that you pay attention to how to write a report, you follow the component method, and respect to categorizing and classifying information. The information you've uncovered, the evidence you have uncovered, is evidence. And it's important that you report it in a way where it can be used effectively to ensure that justice is served. So let's pay attention to what's going to happen right now. Wrap it up in a report investigation. Now before we're done, we can go back or come back. So let's go through what we talked about before in this slide real quick. Each component of the investigative process is designed to uncover leads and develop questions leading to the next component. The subsequent components support efforts to track leads and answer questions developed in previous components. The reason I'm pushing this on you guys right now is if you can get this, understand this concept I'm pushing right now, you got it. That's it. The rest of the stuff I do today is just like review. It really is. But a lot of people don't, if you understand the concept I'm talking about, why we do it in these steps, that's the whole strategy behind it. And you know, if you think about anything you've ever done in athletics or any kind of job, if you understand the strategy, truly understand the strategy, you're good at it, aren't you? It's like, it's like any, any of you are a baseball fan or a football fan or any kind of sport fan, football. When you know the fundamentals of that game, you don't even have to be the best player, do you? You know the fundamentals, you get, you get it down. You know, you got, there could be someone on that field with you who's a hell of a lot better athlete, but they don't get it. They just do their job what they're told to do. When you got someone who understands how everything works together, you get a heck of a player. And that's how it works in investigation, the same thing. You get a heck of a player going on here. So what do we do? Investigative case review analysis. What we got here is you get the case review. You go through this case review. You're going through reports, line by line, page by page analysis. What are we doing? When we get the, the, the discovery material, we're identifying inconsistencies, identifying flaws, discrepancies, and we're developing leads. What are leads? Leads are questions that will be answered in one of the other components. So we develop leads. Then we move on. When we get to the defendant interview, what are we doing here? We're talking to the defendant, we're getting his version of facts, we're answering questions that were developed and leads that were developed in, in one, in component one. He's answering some of those for us. Not all of them, but some of them, okay? We're also identifying more inconsistencies and discrepancies and flaws. Then we move on to three. When we get to the crime scene, what are we doing? We're understanding the crime scene, learning about the crime scene, documenting the crime scene, we're comparing it to the information we learned in, com in the discovery, in the police reports, in the supplemental reports and narratives. We're also comparing the crime scene to what the defendant says, looking for inconsistencies and discrepancies and flaws in information being presented by in both component one and two. And then we're answering, we're, de we're answering some of the questions and leads that were developed in component one and two. We're also developing more leads in component three. Leads that will be answered in either three or five. I mean four or five, right? You see what's happening? Inconsist uh, identify inconsistencies and discrepancies. Develop leads. Answer leads developed in, in, in one. Identify more consistencies and discrepancies and develop more leads. Move to three. Answer some of the questions and leads developed in one and two. Identify more consistencies and discrepancies. Develop more leads to be answered in four and five. Go to four. Go to four, identify more inconsistencies and discrepancies and learn more about the case, g gather more information, develop more leads to be answered in five. When we get to five, we should be in a position where we can either go back to one, two, three, or four, or we're ready to wrap it up and close the case out for a report of investigation. So that's an investigation to uncover reasonable doubt. This is what we do, fundamentally. That's what our role is. The other one had all these things, very clear, boom, 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 okay? Identify a crime's been committed, Cover evidence leading to a suspect, identify a suspect based on the evidence, and refer a suspect for prosecution. In criminal defense investigation, we conduct an investigation to uncover reasonable doubt. How do we do that? 
We can confirm or dismiss an alibi. We can develop alternative suspects. We can question the credibility of witnesses. We can call upon experts to help us in the evaluation of evidence. And we can focus on specific issues, which could be related to identification issues, Fourth Amendment issues, Fifth Amendment issues, any issue you can imagine we can focus on in respect to criminal, uh, criminal defense investigation for the purpose of, of uh, defending the defendant. However, for the most part, conduct an investigation to uncover reasonable doubt. Your role is to uncover reasonable doubt, okay? How do you do that? By getting the truth. That's how you do it. Because our role isn't really to define reasonable doubt. It's not your job. Your job is to uncover evidence, uh, pursue the truth, uncover evidence and facts that can be reported to counsel. Counsel will pick and choose what evidence and facts they decide to use from the knowledge you've assembled. They will decide how to prepare it and how to present it in a courtroom, and ultimately, a jury will make the decision as to whether or not the information that was uncovered during the course of your investigation and filtered through the, uh, through the lawyer and ultimately presented in court, they will make the determination as to what meets the standard of reasonable doubt. They will do it. Our job as investigators is to understand what reasonable doubt is, understand it as a concept, while also understanding it's not our job to go get it because if you did try to go find it, all you would do was give me your opinion of what you think reasonable doubt is. And your opinion may be lacking. Your opinion may not meet the standard, it may not be good enough. On any particular day, your opinion of what reasonable doubt is related to these specific facts could be too conservative or too liberal. It depends on your experiences in life and your evaluation of that particular case, right? So if we have, we, as an investigator, we can't rely on our own interpretation of what the standard of reasonable doubt is. We have to uncover all the facts and evidence available to us, knowing that our job is as purveyors of facts. Our job is to uncover evidence and report it, uncover it impartially and objectively, and not spin it, not contaminate it, not put our own little theories and opinions onto it, but let the attorney look at it in its raw form and let them come to their conclusions about what they can do with that and what they can't do with it. Because reasonable doubt is a concept, it's an idea, and it's open to interpretation by every individual who looks at it. That's what's amazing about our system, that you put six to 12 jurors in a box and they all have to agree on what reasonable doubt is. First of all, have you ever met a reasonable person? Not really, right? Unless they're just like you. What's reasonable? Okay? You have to determine, you know, putting reasonable people in one room to come in what it is, is is really amazing. Well, you could say, according to Black's Law Dictionary, reasonable doubt refers to the degree of certainty required for a juror to find a defendant not guilty. This is the legal definition of reasonable doubt. The degree of certainty required for a jury to find a defendant not guilty. <clears throat> what does that say? It says nothing, if you think about it. It's lawyer talk. It's a definition uh, trying to define it as a, a concept, yet it gives you no parameters or guidelines as to how you can apply it, right? Nothing like that. What tools are, are utilized to determine the existence of reasonable doubt? Anybody tell me? Just your intellect. That's it. That's it. There's no computer program. Your software. They have anything out there yet? It'd be nice, and then you could run it through the computer and, oh, you know, mm -mm. <laughs> you got it. We, we need juries, right? We need it. Just run it through the computer, case closed. We don't have to go try it with this one. It, it met the standard of reasonable doubt, let it go. There is nothing. There's no measuring device. There's no little field test kit that we could use out in the field to run information through. Nothing, nothing. What are we going to use? The human senses? Not really. Sight, smell, hearing, taste, issue? Yeah, we're going to use the five senses to help us evaluate information, ideas, and concepts, and evidence, physical, as well as abstract evidence. And something you're gonna find as a criminal defense investigator, the majority of the evidence we deal with is, is conceptual, because it's testimonial. Testimonial evidence is not tangible, right, at all. It's extremely fluid, and it, it's, 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 it's an idea. It's, it's, it's very conceptual, it's abstract. It's something, sure, when you see it in a transcript in a written report, that's documentary evidence reflecting testimony evidence, but that has already been contaminated by any interference or suggestibility or contact with the person who's doing the interview. It, you know, in its rarest form, testimonial evidence at its purest form is actually when the witness makes the observation. And even then, it's limited. Their perception is limited, you know, in a variety of ways. You know, so the five senses help us evaluate, but ultimately the intellect, the sixth sense, and not Ms. Cleo or the psychic network we're talking about here, is what's going to help you determine what reasonable doubt is, okay? But we as investigators have this interesting thing we have to consider, something you brought up. It's important to bring that up. We have to understand reasonable doubt, but we have to also recognize it's not our job to come to a conclusion if it's there or not, ever. 
We are never going to find yourself as a criminal defense investigator conducting an investigation and then evaluating your own case, looking at your own evidence and going, okay, I think we've got reasonable doubt we're done. Never are you going to do that. That shouldn't even enter your mind. You know why? It's not your problem. It's not your question. That is a question for the jury. That's who it's for. Question for the jury. And the lawyer has to ask that question only in respect to how do I best package this information that you uncovered? How do I best package it in a way that I believe I can create? And they use the word create. Create reasonable doubt in the minds of that jury. So they're trying to you know, manipulate the information and the evidence to convince them, as well as the prosecutor is trying to manipulate and deliver that information in a way which will should, will uh, suggest to the jury that it goes beyond that it, it does meet the standard. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. And what is reasonable doubt? I think the best definition I've ever heard was from uh, Alan Dershowitz. And Dershowitz said, basically, reasonable doubt is this: if you think they probably did it, you have to acquit. That's a heck of a, think about that. That's his state. He goes, if you think they probably did it, if I say, you know what, they're probably guilty, that means you acquit them. Because that's not enough. That's not reasonable doubt. You have to say, yeah, they did it. It's possible they didn't, but not much. You know, they did it. You know, that type of thing. And it's like in a civil case, preponderance of the evidence. The same rule. If you think they probably did it, you can find them, you know, responsible in a civil case for that. So that little probably word is an interesting word that he used. It's a good, because, and the problem with reasonable doubt is definition. Anybody ever been involved in a criminal case at all? Every single criminal case you go to in this United States, in every courtroom, on every specific case, before that, when that, when that, both sides close their case, and say they rest, they go into jury instructions, right? They send the jury out of the room, and then the judge and the two lawyers stand before each other, and you know what they discuss? They discuss what definition they're going to give that jury for, for reasonable doubt. The definition is different every single time. It's actually argued. And then they become to an agreement on what they're going to tell the jury what reasonable doubt is. Is that amazing? That you know, we call it a criminal justice system. Actually, criminologists, we call it a criminal justice non-system <laughs> because the system works the <laughs> same every time, and this doesn't. Every single case, there's a new discussion and agreement on how reasonable doubt was going to be explained. And that's why this, as criminal defense investigators, this is what you have to deal with. Look at what you'd have to do as a law enforcement officer. How simple, cut and dry, boom, 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 boom. As, this is why so many people have such trouble at criminal defense investigations. Okay, so much trouble with it. If you are not an abstract thinker, you're in the wrong field. If, you wanna, if you're a scientist, you like numbers, you like things to fit, if you like mathematics because everything ends at the same, wrong field. You're going to get killed in this field. We'll talk about the philosophy of investigation because it was a perfect uh, leading into this right now. Is Philosophy and investigation is extremely important. Again, knowing that you do this, you, you can be taught to do something, but you're going to know why you're doing it. Okay, and something we just discussed a few minutes ago about being investigators, we're tasked with uncovering the truth. We're also tasked with un understanding the concepts of reasonable doubt, all right? But the truth, ultimately as an investigator, you are supposed to be an, invest an expert in the truth, right? A truth. We understand what the truth is. This is what we're looking for, the truth. So kind of going back to the question of what is reasonable doubt, what is the truth? You know, what is the truth? One of the best lines, even philosophically, you can ever get historically was, I think, is, is actually from the Bible. And when he says, you know, Pontius Pilate, the truth, what is that? <laughs> you know, it's a great line. It's a great line. You know, because it's the truth, what is that? Really, what is it? What is the truth? We hear all the time as investigators, you try to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? But what is it? What is that? You know, we had a great discussion of this probably about four or five years ago when Bill Clinton was the president. What a great discussion naturally on truth. Remember what he said? Well, it depends what is is. You know what's funny? He was right. It depends what is is. Because he was actually brought out a national debate on truth as a relative concept as opposed to absolute. Some people view truth as a relative concept. Some people view it as absolute. You know, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me, right? And some people say, no, there's only one truth. That's all there is. There's one truth. And it's a, it's a, it's, we have, as investigators, we have to understand these, these uh, opposing schools of thought because we're dealing with people. When we go out in the field and talk to people, you're not working in a vacuum. You are talking to every person you talk to is an individual with their own school of thought, their own experiences, their own biases, their own prejudices, and they come to their own interpretations of what they see, and they come to their own conclusions based upon those interpretations. When someone tells you something, and, and when we use in the, in the investigation field, in a legal field, we say someone is not credible. 
We're not necessarily saying they're lying. You'll very rarely hear a lawyer tell a witness, you're lying. You'll very rarely hear them call him a liar. All right? Because what they tend to go on is the credibility is a question here. Because we are limited to what we see by, you know, we're our, everything that we observe is an interpretation, not a mirrored reflection of it. Okay? Period. It's an interpretation of what we see. And that could have a, 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 a lot of variables. Where you stand in respect to a, an incident occurring has an impact on your ability to, to, uh, to make an observation, right? What if you're, you know, one person's here, one person's there. If you've got two people, if me and him are standing and we're engaged in some kind of argument or confrontation or he's doing something, you're going to have a certain view of this, right? But you're going to see more of what I'm doing and even limited by his blocking my hands or stuff, then you're going to see his facial expressions, right? And if he's facing me, you're not going to have the luxury of using his facial expressions to help you determine what's going on between us, are you? It's not there. So you're going to be relying more on what I'm doing to help you understand what he's doing. And a lot of what you're doing is going to be assuming his reactions. You know, it's kind of like what we do as human beings is we see A, B, C, and E, so we automatically assume what? Oh, there was D. And we fill in the blanks. You know, we throw it in there because I saw this. I'll give you an instance in a, in a traffic accident. How many times I've seen as an investigator people say, well, yeah, I saw the accident. The blue car hit the red car. Okay, it did, yeah. You ask, never ask a question as an investigator, what happened? Because when you ask someone what happened, they give you their interpretation of what happened. They always say, what did you see exactly? And give it to me in chronological order. In that same instance, I said, what happened here? The red car hit the blue car. Oh, okay, great. Well, Tell me how it took place. Well, where were you? I was standing here. Who were you talking to? I was talking to my friend. And where exactly? I was facing that way. Okay, what happened then? What drew your attention to the accident? Well, I heard a big bang, and then I turned. What did you just learn? They didn't see the accident. They heard the big bang, and they turned. And then they made assumptions based on what? What they saw after the fact, what people told them. Somebody, oh, yeah, the blue car hit the red. They started to draw this other information in where they really didn't see it. They start to put the pieces of the puzzle together, the missing pieces they fit in based upon other sources of information. That's what happens sometimes. Um, in res respect to the truth, as investigators, we need to understand what truth is, and that we do this because truth is understanding on a philosophical level is where you're going to find answers to some of this stuff, at least understanding how truth is, uh, is perceived by other people. And you should have your own understanding of it as well. Again, the human race has pursued this elusive adversary for thousands of years because we're no closer to the truth now than we were you know, back in 2400 BC. 2300 BC when Plato was written, and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle were, were discussing it. Okay, we have no closer meaning to it, and probably even farther away from it, if, unless you consider technology as an advancement for getting to what the ultimate truth is. The investigator maintains a rich history and philosophical connection to the greatest minds of all times. Okay, Philosophy, uh, the investigator philosopher, which uh, again is something uh, we like to push through the CDIDC. Philosophy technically defined as the critical evaluation of all the facts of experience. The philosopher must evaluate all information with rigorous scrutiny, dismissing bias and prejudice of any kind. This is what a philosopher technically defined is. So think about that. Replace philosophy with investigation. You could say investigation technically defined is the critical evaluation of all the facts of experience or inexperience or an incident. The, the investigator must evaluate all information with rigorous scrutiny, dismissing bias and prejudice of any kind. They're interchangeable. The, the practical philosopher. Plato described the traits of a philosopher, and this also be identified as the traits of a good investigator, as good memory, quickness at learning, broadness of vision, love and affiliation to truth, morality, courage, and self-discipline. Okay? In practical sense, as I can tell you right now, this last one is very important for an investigator. Self-discipline is unbelievable um, because you, we don't work in a structured environment as investigators. We work a very fluid environment with things changing all the time. And your history is you couldn't show up to work on time and always tried to leave early. You're probably going to have a tough time in this field because you've got it. Now you don't have someone telling you to do it. You have to do it. And a lot of times it doesn't get done. Key to success is a quote you probably heard. First, eliminate the impossible. Whatever is left, however improbable, must be the truth. Any Sherlock Holmes fans? You know, Sherlock and Conan Doyle, great comment. And it is a totally applies to what we do as investigators. First, eliminate the impossible. Whatever is left, however improbable, must be the truth. If you think about that comment, it just makes a lot of sense. It really does. I memorize this thing because sometimes in the field when I'm having a tough time with something, I start to think like that. You know, sometimes you can't find the obvious path to where the truth is. Sometimes you've got all these possibilities. The best way to approach all these possibilities is the process of elimination. And, and that's even found in the scientific community, right? You eliminate the impossible. Whatever's left, however improbable, say that doesn't make sense, but that's all that's left there. You know, to quote those three great American philosophers, uh, Curly, Larry, and Moe, no other place around the place, this must be the place. You ever hear that, Three Stooges? 
How do we determine truth? Human beings implement many methods and tests to determine truth. The investigator should be aware of, avail of all available methods in order to understand perspectives of others when they present him or her with information which they believe to be true. Uh, again, as investigators, uh, probably 90% of what we do is deal with testimonial evidence. We deal with people. We deal with witnesses in the criminal defense matter. We have contact with other people. Uh, people from other cultures, from other races, from other socioeconomic levels. As an investigator, you have to be a chameleon of sorts. You really do. You have to, it's, it's not so much that you have to be accepted in other, in other cultures, other communities, other socioeconomic levels. What I've learned is you have to be comfortable in those other cultures, other socioeconomic levels. Other, other, you know what I'm saying? Um, I've had a lot of people say to me over the years sometimes, I've, said, I've been doing it for about 20 years, and people have said to me, um, well, what do you do when you, you have to go to a Hispanic community or you have to go to a, uh, uh, you have to go to a uh, African American community? Do you send in an investigator who's from that community? I go, well, no, if I don't have money. I go, they go, well, how, the people don't talk to you, do they? I go, boy, you don't have much faith in people. <laughs> you know, I go, it, it really is, as long as you're comfortable anywhere, people talk to you. You know, that's the way it is. I go, if you're comfortable wherever you go, you blend, you know, because right away, if you're a nice person, if you get along with people and you, you know how to break down barriers, no one holds it against you, you know? It, they get past it right away. But if you walk in anywhere and you seem uncomfortable, what happens is, because what happens when people are uncomfortable? Sometimes that, that, that level of, that lack of comfort, comfort is interpreted by the person as either bias or prejudice or arrogance or, you know, all kinds of things. As opposed to if you seem comfortable wherever you go, people just accept you. You know, I mean, a lot of you here may have that problem. Does anybody here really have a problem with other cultures or other socioeconomic levels? No, because you don't mind, right? It's like when you, if you walk into an extremely poor economic neighborhood, is if you if you walk in there not feeling above them or arrogant or superior, they're not going to interpret you as feeling that way, okay? And they don't. You you get past it and you're able to deal with it. You you know treat people with respect wherever you go. You know, I, I've been in situations where standing on a rooming house door with a, 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 a crackhead just spread across the thing, and I'm asking, excuse me, sir. <laughs> you know, they're not, hey, dirtbag, kick him in the back of the head, tell me where I can find this, excuse me, sir. Just, you, you treat him with some level of respect. The same thing goes with a, if you go into Sailfish Point, you know, or you walk into Sewell's Point, you walk into a $2 million home. You know, if you walk in there, if you feel inferior, they will detect that, and they'll use it against you, right? They'll feel above you, and now you're the one. It's you who feels here, and now you place there. So when you go into any situation, just go in like this. When you're an even plane, the people pick up on right away. I've never had a problem dealing with it, ever, you know? And so it's, it's not something you really find there. But we have to understand, again, what their truths are. We have to understand, how do people come to determinations about what they see as being a fact or being the true? Remember we said people have, when people observe something, they, they interpret it and then they give you a conclusion based on their interpretation. But what makes people do that? We have to understand when you're interviewing people that if we can understand this process takes place, what we can sometimes do is we can try to identify what it is that's causing them to do that and we can filter through it and get to what they actually saw, what they observed. As your, your eyes are able to process, I believe it's, it's 5,000 bytes of information per second. Your eyes can process 5,000 bytes of information per second, okay? That's what your eyes can process. Think about peripheral vision, everything that's going, all this information. You just look around the room right now. Look how much your eyes see. But where's your focus, right? You're focused on different things. Your eyes process 5,000 bytes of information per second. Your mind processes an average of 500 bytes of information per second. Think of the difference. And that's because of the focus. Okay? We see a lot more than we can process as far as the mind is concerned. We see things going on. Think about when you're driving down the road. You ever been driven, go from work to home at the end of a day and been on a cell phone and you're driving down the road and you finally get home and you realize, my God, I just forgot. I went through all these stop signs, all these stoplights. I don't even remember the drive at all. Well, you saw all that. You, everything was going through. You were just going on autopilot. And you got there. You're, all this is going on, but what are we focusing on? Okay, and that makes a huge difference. So naive realism is something. We see it, it must be true. It's not always the case. Our eyes are deceptive. And what about people who wear eyeglasses? What if you, have, you don't have 20-20 vision? When we talk about truth is, is relative, it's like Protagoras, truth is relative. It's only a matter of opinion. 
He says, yes, you mean that truth is mere subjective opinion. Exactly. What is true for you is true for you, and what is true for me is true for me. Socrates, do you really mean that, that my opinion is true by virtue of being my opinion? He goes, indeed I do. So Socrates responds, my opinion is truth is absolute, not opinion, and that you, Mr. Protagoras, are absolutely in error. Since this is my opinion, then you must grant that it is true according to your own philosophy. He says, you are quite right, Socrates. Right? If you say truth is relative, then you have to agree with a person who says it's absolute that they're right. So it turns into a big, vicious circle. I'm going to show you how it can. We're going to talk about that right now real quick, okay? This is what my little cartoon's for, okay, to explain this theory, okay? This is an individual who's observing a scene. Here's a little, I'm not saying what that is, but what does it appear to be? A guy sticking up over. Right? Looks like a guy doing a stick up, right? Doing an armed robbery over here, right? We've got a witness here. He's observing this incident, okay? Now what's happening, we talked about too, number one, we've got what we call a cone of influence. His eyes are able to observe in process, okay, 5,000 bytes of information per second, right? Go into the eyes. Now remember again, although he's looking at the scene, there could be three other people watching the same scene, right? Same thing. But those three other people physically are all looking at it from three different physical perspectives, aren't they? One could be on the back, one could be on the side, one could be down a little farther down the road, all observing the same incident, but all have a physical perspective that is different from each other. That alone can allow for a difference in their evaluation and interpretation of what happened, can't it? What they could see is different from what the other could see, from the, everything from distance to the focal point, as well as anything that may be obstructing their view. Okay? Now, that is just a physical influence that could contaminate their statements when they actually report what they observed, okay? which would account for why when you take three people, four people, put them on an intersection, they all watch the same accident, they all see something different because they're all looking at it from a different physical perspective. That's just one form of non unintentional contamination that takes place. Right? That's what's going on here. Now, we also have, when we talked about the 5,000 bytes of information per second being observed, we also have the mind only processing, intellectually, 500 bytes of information per second. Think about, if we lined three people up right next to this guy, all looking at it from almost the same perspective, although they're all seeing the same thing overall, where's their focus? His focus may be on the robber. The other person's focus may be on the victim. Now think about this. When you walk through a mall, you ever walk through the mall and just notice someone and you, your focus went on them because they remind you of someone? They look like a friend or a relative or somebody you knew. Is that so-and-so? Or sometimes you look at a person and you may notice a hat they're wearing or a coat they're wearing because you have one just like it or you like that particular thing that they have. Our focus is always on something different than other people. And that also, so when we're focusing here, the point is we're all processing an average of 5,000 bytes of information per second with our eyes. The problem is what we're processing through our minds is different based upon our focus. So even though we're looking at the same thing, we're all focused on something else. When you take, uh, do that exercise where, let's say if I had Brad come in here, take something and walk away, and I asked everybody to describe here, you know, what was he wearing, give a full description. Everybody gives a different description or not quite, some people are missing things because you weren't looking at it, you weren't focused on it. Someone was looking up here, didn't pay attention. It makes a big difference if you just turned and glanced at him because he reached across and if, if uh, Tom was actually looking at him because he had a wider view of the whole thing going on, you know. So that, credi that can be a, a, make a major impact on your credibility as a witness and understanding that as an investigator makes a difference. So we have all this going on. There's some other things going on. When I call this the cone of influence, as the eyes are... Uh, where his, his physical location has an influence on what he's able to observe, okay? As far as, and this is the truth right here. This is the truth that's happening. That's the truth. The truth isn't here. The truth's here, right? That's what's actually taking place. His physical location has an impact on what he can observe and not observe. So he's, his interpretation of this event, his testimonial evidence is already being contaminated by his physical location and perspective to this incident. Then we have him observing the entire incident. His focus is only focusing on something. It can't focus on everything. It's fo is he a trained eye, an untrained eye? Why is his attention drawn? When was it his attention drawn? That has an influence on his interpretation of the incident itself when it finally gets over here and you get one of those light bulbs going off, right? In his head, okay? His interpretation. So now it's all being funneled back. Now as this is being funneled back, think about all those criterions of truth we talked about. What else is happening in this cone before it even gets to his head, the process? As it gets in his head, we've got this. We've got bias. We've got prejudice. 
right? We've got experience. All these things are taking place. Everything we've ever done in our life, or our experiences, or our prejudice, or our biases are being used to interpret this event and funnel back before he even comes to determination. So that when this officer comes to this witness and says, what happened? That truth has already been contaminated by the influences of this witness. That's why when you ask him what happened, you have to ask, what did you see? I'd like to thank you for joining me throughout this process and allowing me to be your instructor. What I'd recommend to you is don't stop your training here. You contact our organization at defenseinvestigator.com or 1-800-465-5233 and talk to me, Brandon Perrin, the national director, the training coordinator, or the academic director about obtaining further training, advanced training, in a variety of the different disciplines that we offer. You are now ready to go out and work in the field and start affecting our justice system in a way that would be positive. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me, and I look forward to meeting you at one of our various seminars which are offered around the country. If you cannot attend these seminars because of your proximity to our training programs, please feel free to contact us at our website, and you can purchase additional DVD material or distance learning programs which will advance your own career, advance our justice system, and advance freedom itself. Thank you very much.